This is Back to the Bible with pastor and Bible teacher Brian Clark. Welcome to another life-transforming study from God's Word. Today, Brian goes to the book of James to pinpoint the essence of temptation. Later, he'll join Back to the Bible CEO Arnie Cole and author Kara Whitney in studio to answer questions and break down today's message for your life. Now let's go to Brian Clark with today's study from James. If you have a Bible, turn with us to James chapter 1. I can't imagine a subject that's more practical than the subject of temptation. The text in James is perhaps the most insightful and the most practical on the topic of temptation in the entire New Testament. Verse 12 is kind of a hinge verse. It hinges from the previous text into the text that we're going to talk about today. Verse 15, then when lust has conceived, the English translation doesn't, uh, doesn't use the word the, but it's important to understand the Greek actually reads in verse 15, then when the lust has the definite article there. Again, it confirms the idea that this is talking about the core issue, the lust, out of which all other flows. Then when the lust has conceived. James is going to use a powerful birth analogy. Everybody understands that life begins at conception. When a husband and wife come together, a child is conceived. James is saying that's where temptation starts. It starts at the point of conception. There is a thought that enters into my mind to meet a legitimate need my own way. I start to think about certain behavior, a certain attitude, a certain response. Whatever it is, there's this thought that's been conceived where I would like to do this. There's something deep inside that, that conceives of this. That is the point at which temptation must be dealt with. If you deal with temptation at the point of conception with a disciplined mind, you will be wildly successful. You will live a life of integrity and uprightness. The farther this process is allowed to go, the lower the chances are that you're going to respond correctly. In order to really deal with temptation, you must have a disciplined mind. And at the point of conception, you must realize what's happening. What's happening here is I have a legitimate need, and that need is apparently going unmet. So I'm starting to think that maybe I should meet that need my way instead of God's way. And I'm thinking about taking charge and doing something that I previously would not have considered. It's at that point when I need to wake up and think, what am I doing? Do I really believe if I become my own God and take charge of my own life, I can make it better than God can make it? That's the moment of truth. When lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. It means that that thought has been allowed to stay there. It stays in the womb of my mind. I feed it. I nurture it. It continues to grow until it's ready to be delivered. So now I've allowed it to stay there. I've justified it. I've rationalized it, I've explained it away, I've figured out some reason why for me that behavior is acceptable. And now I'm at a point where I'm ready to give birth to the action. It gives birth to sin and when sin is accomplished, it brings forth death. Literally the Greek here is it's still born. It's a very powerful imagery. Going from what I thought would bring me so much happiness and joy has actually broken my heart. Many of you couples have been through this process, literally. A husband and wife, they come together, they conceive a child. The child grows in the womb, and it's a time of great excitement. 
We're excited about this new life. We get the bedroom ready. We buy the furniture. We think about names. It's a wonderful time. And finally comes the moment when that child is to be delivered and everybody's excited. Here's this new life. It's going to change our lives and bring us so much joy. But in that moment when the excitement is way up here, you hear the words of the doctor, I'm sorry, but your child is dead, stillborn. You go from what you thought was going to be such a joyous moment to absolute devastation. Now, as I said, some of you couples have been through that literally. All of us have been through that metaphorically with temptation. Somewhere along the way, we conceived a thought and we convinced ourselves, this is going to make me happy. This is going to make life better. For some reason, in my case, this choice is acceptable. And we nurtured that and we fed that until finally it gave birth to the action. Sometimes people will say when they gave in to temptation, it just happened. It has never just happened. It's always been the result of something that started before that, that was allowed to fester, is allowed to be nurtured and fed, to give birth to the action. And somehow you convinced yourself this would be fun. This would be good. This would make my life better. But in that moment, your joy drops to devastation when you realize what you thought would make you so happy has actually been stillborn, and it has brought nothing but heartache and devastation. This past week, I read a quote by Dallas Willard. He said, uh, reality is what you run into when you're wrong. That is a great quote. Reality is what you run into when you're wrong. People can talk about truth and redefining truth all they want to, but at some point you have to face reality. It smacks you in the face. In this process of temptation, we can, we can rationalize, we can excuse, we can figure out all the reasons why in our case it's okay, and in our case it's going to work in our favor, and all the reasons why this would be a good thing, but the moment that you give birth to the action, you get smacked in the face with reality. You can lie to yourself all you want, but at the end of the story, reality smacks you in the face and says, this wasn't good. What you thought would make you happy has broken your heart. It's exactly the narrative in Genesis chapter 3. Adam and Eve are convinced that life would be better their way, but the moment that they sin against God, they know they've been had, that they had been lied to, and they are devastated. They hide from God, they point fingers at one another, and everything falls apart. Verse 16, do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. James is saying, don't believe the lie. The lust deep within all of us is this strong desire as people made in the image of God to think I can be my own God. With me running the show, it would be better. Or in this particular case, with this particular need, I think I need to do it my way because I don't think God's going to come through for me this time. James says, don't be deceived. That's a lie. It's the same lie for thousands of years. The enemy is crafty, he's just not very unique. He's used the same line for thousands of years and it continues to work very effectively. You're listening to Back to the Bible. If you'd like to listen again, visit backtothebible.org. That's backtothebible.org. Now let's return to our study with Bible teacher Brian Clark. Verse 17, every good thing given in every perfect gift is from above. This is now getting to the discussion related to the goodness of God. James says, don't be deceived. Everything that's good and everything that's perfect, that means the absence of moral evil. We would probably use the word right. Everything that's good and everything that's right comes from God. 
There is no plan B. There is no alternate source. There is nothing that can come into your life that's going to make you more happy, more joyful, more fulfilled, that's going to more deeply satisfy that need than what God has to offer. Nothing. But this is the question we wrestle with. Do we believe that? Do I believe that ultimately everything that's good and right comes from God? Therefore, God is God. I submit and surrender to that, and I will do it his way. I will meet a legitimate need God's way. Or am I going to believe the lie that I can do better than God? Is there anything out there that this world has to offer that is better? The text says no. Everything that's good, everything that's right, comes from God. Every time we give in to temptation, what we're saying is, I don't believe that. I don't believe that. God, I don't believe you really are as good as you say you are. I don't believe you really love me as much as you say you love me. I'm going to meet this need my way because I don't trust you to come through. James says, every good thing and every perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shifting shadow. In the ancient world, shadows were a big deal. They didn't have uh, electric lighting, and so basically they depended on the light of the sun, with the exception of maybe a fire and a candle here or there. But most of life was lived with significant shadows. And so in both the Old and New Testament, shadows became kind of a metaphor. It's places where the bad guys hide. It's places where the animals hide. It's places where you experience an ambush. It's places where you put things where you don't want anybody to see them. Shadows were a big part of life. So the idea that God is the father of lights is saying he's the originator. He's the creator of light. He isn't just light, but he's the originator of light. It emanates from him. It flows out of him. Therefore, it's not possible that there could be any shadows. There's no pockets of darkness. There's no secret sides of God that are evil. Therefore, it goes to the idea that everything that's good and everything that's right comes from God. God has no bad side. God has no evil side. It's just light. Verse 18, in the exercise of his will, meaning according to his plan, he brought us forth. God has his own birthing language, his own birthing metaphor. Brings us forth is Greek for giving birth to. God gave us birth. Just like in the story of Nicodemus, we have been born again. How does that happen? By the word of truth. In other words, the enemy lies to us and says to us, you could be your own God. With you in charge, life would be better. With you in charge, that need would be met. With you in charge, everything's going to be uh, what you've always wanted it to be. Religion is driven by this lie that says you can do it yourself. You can make yourself good enough. You can make yourself acceptable to God. Just try really hard. You can do it. But the text says we were rebirthed by God according to the word of truth. God came along and said, hey, folks, that's a lie. You can't be your own God, and you cannot save yourself, and you're never going to find life in your choices, in your decisions, and in your way. Actually, you're a desperate sinner headed for judgment if something doesn't change. So God himself became flesh and allowed himself to be nailed on the cross in payment for your sin. That those who believe by faith that Jesus did this for me experience the forgiveness of sin and we are reborn. That's the language here. The word of truth was you need a savior. The word of truth is everything that's good and right comes from God. The word of truth is there's nothing this world has to offer that can even come close to the life that God offers. The word of truth is your way is destructive and God's way is life. So we were rebirthed according to the word of truth. 
so that we would be kind of first fruits among his creatures. The idea of first fruits is taking the first of the crop or the herd, the best of what you have and giving it to God. We would say today to give God the best of my talent, to give God the best of my time and the best of my energy and the best of my resources. But in this particular text, God is saying you are his first fruit. You are the, the glimpse of what is to come. First fruit always carried the idea that this is the first gift with more to come. God is saying, when I rebirthed you, that was uh, just a glimpse of what is to happen to all creation. One day God is going to redeem all creation back to himself. That's what Romans 8 says. God's plan for this universe was always Genesis 1 and 2. God hasn't scrapped that plan. He's not coming up with plan B. That's always been the plan. And the promise is I'm going to do what's necessary. And I'm going to redeem all creation back to what I always intended. A future more glorious than we could begin to describe. But amazing as it may sound, when God rebirthed you, he wanted you to be a glimpse of what is to come that you would demonstrate life lived under the goodness of God, life lived under the, the right things of God. This is a glimpse of the kingdom that is to come. Therefore, what he calls us to be is a people that find our, our life and our meaning and our purpose from him, believing that everything that's good and everything that's right, it comes from him. Therefore, we become the prototype. We're just a glimpse of what is to come. We're the first fruit of what will ultimately be fulfilled when the end of the story is told. The question we all must wrestle with is, do we believe that's true? Do you believe that ultimately God is good? And that everything that's good and everything that's right comes from him. You cannot find more life. You cannot find more joy. You cannot find more happiness. You cannot find more fulfillment for those needs in anything outside of God. Or do I believe that life would be better with me in charge? Life would be better with me calling the shots. Life would be better with me running the show. That if I determine to meet my own needs, somehow that's going to make me more happy than what God can deliver. The core issue in every temptation is, do I believe life is better with me in charge? Or do I believe life is better with God in charge? Nobody gets up in the morning and says, hey, I think today I'll ruin my life. But every day, people make devastating choices that make a mess out of everything. What's it going to be for you? Now let's join Bible teacher Brian Clark in the studio with Arthur Kara Whitney and Back to the Bible CEO Arnie Cole. So here's the big question. What do we need to know to understand and resist temptation? So the imagery in James is really powerful. As a matter of fact, as a preacher, knowing there's a lot of people sitting in the audience that have experienced this pain, it's kind of difficult to, to present. But the idea that it starts with conception, just like with a child, the child is nurtured and grows in the womb and, and then is born. So what the parents thought was gonna make them so happy is stillborn and it just absolutely devastates them breaks their heart so that's a powerful imagery so coming back to the idea of conception there is a moment when that temptation is conceived in my mind you know i hear people say well it just happened it's like well no it didn't just happen there were things preceding that that built to that point and as a pastor, there's no question in my mind that if you deal with it at the conception level early on, you'll be highly successful. If you're trying to deal with it at the birth level, like you're fighting every day not to give in to a temptation, you're probably going to lose that battle. It's, it's developed 
to such a degree that you're you're starting to rationalize, you're thinking about it, you envision it, and at some point you're going to hit a weak moment and probably make a decision that you wish you hadn't. Is there a, a way to identify when the moment of conception happens? I think just awareness when you're entertaining a thought that you know is wrong. And at that point, I find it really helpful to go back through the process. What is the need? And what would it mean to trust God to meet this need? And why am I thinking I have to do this myself? That's what I'm entertaining. Can God be trusted with this particular need? So I think there's a point where I'm thinking about it, and that's where it has to be attacked. So there's this stillborn birth that we've talked about. Uh, Then also in verse 18, God brought us forth. This is uh, about new life, right? Yeah, so this is another uh, birth metaphor, which is much more Nicodemus born again, that we have become a new creation in Christ. Uh, You realize it talks about the truth. You realize you can't save yourself. You can't become self-righteous. You desperately need a Savior. And based on that truth, you believe and you are born again. I think the critical thing for people to understand is until that moment happens, there isn't going to be a lot of success in resisting temptation. It's not just go out there and grit your teeth and try harder. Until there is new life in Christ and the power of the Spirit within us, we're probably not going to be real successful. So for our listeners to understand, if you're struggling, that's where it starts. And I find when I process it at that level, it really gets me back to, do I believe God is good and can I trust him with this? And that's where I can shut it down at the conception level because that's like core theology. So that's really helpful. The other part of it is most everybody from time to time and and maybe often is at somewhere on that scale of conception to the actual birth to the action. So it's like, where am I in that? And so if you take a football imagery, there's a lot of Christians in the red zone. There's a lot of our listeners right now in the red zone. It's been conceived, they think about it, they're wrestling with it, they dwell on it, they fantasize about it, and they're in the red zone. Unless something happens really quickly, they're going to make a decision that they may regret for the rest of their lives. So it's helpful to realize I'm at a really vulnerable point and something needs to happen or, or it's going to break my heart. This is Back to the Bible. Thanks for joining us today. Be sure to tune in again tomorrow for another encouraging message from God's Word with Brian Clark. To listen again or find out more about our speakers, come to backtothebible.org.